uh, great pleasure to have uh, Varun uh, giving today's talk. Um, Varun works in jet physics, has worked on many uh, really interesting pro fundamental problems about jets like factorization and in particular factorization in the context of uh, in medium uh, jets and stuff like that. And, and so for a while now we were uh, hoping that we get some opportunity to have a talk by him. And uh, yeah, so right now we're doing it online, but we hope to have an in-person talk um, with, from him soon. So Varun did his PhD in Carnegie Mellon, and then he had postdoctoral stints at Los Alamos and at MIT. And uh, after that, he joined uh, South Dakota uh, quite recently, right? Less than a year back. Yeah, as yeah. A, as a faculty nice. member. Yeah. And uh, so he will be talking about uh, uh, application of EFTs for jet physics, I guess, in, in heavy air collisions. Yeah. Yeah. So, Barun, please. Yeah, so uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. And um, yeah, before I start, um, please feel free to interrupt, to interrupt me to ask questions in between. Um, because I'm not exactly sure, uh, since I have never interacted with this audience before, I'm not sure what the uh, familiarity is with this topic. Though some men did say that, uh, sorry, yeah, I did say that few of the people do, do work in uh, heavy ion physics. So that would be good. So anyway, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, understanding nuclear structure uh, with effective field theories, specifically from scattering experiments. So as you all know, most of our information about hydronic structure, including the quark gluon plasma, comes mainly from scattering experiments. And for me, it's a really interesting problem to try and understand how we can access uh, the microscopic uh, physics of these phases of QCD uh, via these scattering experiments. And um, for these kind of processes, effective field theories are usually a really powerful tool uh, for uh, describing such processes. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, so if you look at uh, what scattering experiments we do have that access the different regions of the QCD phase diagram, um, you have uh, the relativistic heavy ion collider, which was running at Brookhaven on Long Island, um, which essentially is a heavy ion collider and uh, uh, which creates the quark gluon plasma. And so you can think of it as probing the hot phase of uh, QCD. Uh, on the cooler side, you have the electron ion collider, which will be upcoming in the same um, location in about 10 years. And its primary goal is to access uh, the microscopic structure of um, uh, the cold phase of QCD, which is basically hadrons and atomic nuclei. And then you have the LHC, which does essentially both of those things in different experiments. So it looks like we have the whole region of the QCD phase diagram nicely covered, except for the region where we go to really high densities, where we don't have direct access through colliders. But in all of these scattering experiments, um, the goal is to access the microscopic structure of the hot and cold phase of QCD using high energy scattering. So in this talk, I'm primarily, primarily going to talk about the physics of heavy ion collisions. Uh, although as I go along in the talk, um, I will connect this work with uh, the other scattering experiments who actually probe the cold phase of QCD as well uh, with an EFT. Uh, to connect the two of them. So coming to heavy ion physics, I'm sure you have seen this figure before. You have two really heavy ions, such as maybe gold or lead, which are accelerated to about 99% of the speed of light and smashed into one another. And uh, the, the hope is that this increases the temperature and the density of the region enough so that the quarks and gluons, which are usually tied up in terms of, in terms of colorless hadrons, become free at least for some amount of time and are able to roam freely over a region larger than a single hadron. And that's essentially what we call as the QGP phase. Now from the color coll current colliders um, uh, at RIC as well as uh, at LHC, we know that the temperature that's achieved is of the order of few hundred MeV to about a thousand MeV. 
which is still pretty much non perturbative which is to say that the qgp that we do create in these experiments is uh, is a strongly coupled fluid so we can't have a perturbative description of this medium in a simple manner uh, and anyway this medium exists for a really short period of time a, a few for uh, femtoseconds which uh, and then it uh, cools down and dissipates and you get a bunch of hadrons at the end of the day uh, so our goal is to try to understand what are the microscopic properties of this medium. Uh, and usually the way to do it is to shine some external probe on it. Uh, so that by studying how the probe gets modified by interacting with this medium, we can say something about the properties of the medium. Um, that's the classic experiment that we do for finding the structure of any piece of matter. So in this case, uh, the probe that we are using is essentially a high energy jet. And what I mean by that is, uh, apart from the creation of this QGP phase itself, you have certain uh, high energy scatterings that happen in the background, which are rarer. Uh, but in those kinds of scatterings of two nucleons, uh, you can create high energy partons, meaning the energy of those partons is much larger than the temperature of the QGP itself. So for example, in this figure, you can see that at the periphery of the QGP medium, you have a QQ bar pair being created, which has a much higher energy than the uh, temperature, typical temperature of the QGP. And in this, in this particular case, one of the jets is sort of evolving in vacuum, right? So it's creating a shower of collimated particles, which we call as a jet, uh, which is essentially uh, evolving in vacuum and its partner, is essentially traveling through the medium. And while it travels through the medium, it interacts strongly with it and gets modified. And by looking at the modification of the properties of this jet, we can say, perhaps say something about the microscopic structure of the QGP itself. So in that sense, the jet is acting as an X-ray or a hard probe of the quantum plasma. Uh, as I said that uh, for a microscopic description, we are looking at length scales which are much shorter than the typical mean free path in this medium, which is why a hydrodynamic description is not a suitable description, at least for the description of how the jet evolves in this medium. Um, at the same time, people have tried to use holographic techniques to do this, but um, as we all know, they can at best give us qualitative results or maybe some bounds on some physical quantities. Uh, but we are really, there is no systematic way of improving uh, the numerical predictions from uh, such type of methods. So in the background of all this, what we, what the precise question we want to ask is, get, that is that how exactly can we make um, predictions for uh, jet evolution in this uh, strongly coupled medium? So that's the question I'm going to try and answer in this talk. Um, so... If I were to give the answer to this question in a single word, and the, the word would be factorization. Um, and over the next few slides, I'm going to try and explain this idea. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with it. Uh, but just to, uh, just to get ourselves, all of us on the same page, I'm going to give you some examples of how this idea works uh, in simpler context, and then try and apply this for the case of heavy iron physics. Okay, so, Dealing with non perturbative medium in the sense a strongly coupled medium is really not a, not, not a new problem in nuclear physics. We are usually faced with the same issue in just hydronic colliders, for example, at a PP collider in, at the LHC or uh, an electron ion collider. Uh, in each of these cases, you have a strongly coupled state, either a hadron or a nucleus, again, which cannot be described simply by perturbation theory. But in those cases, we are able to make precise predictions for a host of observables. Um, and uh, for example, uh, I'm going to look at two particular cases. One is deep inelastic scattering, which is, you can think of it as the harmonic oscillator of uh, nuclear physics. And the other is Drelian. And in each of these cases, the way we make predictions is that we rely on the idea of factorization. Um, so what exactly do I mean by that is, uh, so let's look first at the uh, at the DIS experiment, which is basically you are taking a high energy electron and shooting it at a hadron, uh, and the electron after interacting with the hadron basically gets deflected, and you measure the properties of the electron, and and uh, try and see what you can learn about uh, the properties of the hadron from it. Right. So that's essentially the 
uh, the process. So the cross section, I will write it down as E minus P to E minus plus X, where X can be anything else. So I don't care what, uh, what is being created. In that sense, it's an inclusive process. So from an effective field theory point of view, there are essentially two scales in the problem. One is uh, the momentum of the photon, which I will call as Q, which forms the ultraviolet scale of my EFT, effective field theory. And the other is, is the infrared scale, which is the hadron mass scale, lambda QCD, uh, which is well separated away from this. So there is a hierarchy between these two scales. Uh, and I know that uh, when I have such a separation of scales, I can write down uh, a very simple equation for the cross section that I'm interested in, in this case, uh, which is essentially that it factorizes into two functions. So one is uh, what I will call as the heart function, which basically describes all the physics at that single scale Q, which is my UV scale. And the other is uh, the part on distribution function, which describes all of the physics at the scale lambda QCD. And this, this split or this factorization is valid to leading order in the expansion parameter, which is just the ratio of the two scales. So we can think of this as the expansion or the power counting parameter of my effective field theory. Um, and, uh, so this depends, uh, as depends upon this factor X, which you have probably seen before, which is just the Bjork and X, which is the quark fraction of the proton momentum, essentially. And the factorization that I've written down here is valid for X, which is of the order of one. So what I mean by factorization in this context is that I can compute these two functions separately, independently to all orders in perturbation theory. Obviously, the heart function sits at the scale Q so that it's perturbatively, perturbatively calculable, whereas the part on distribution function, which sits at the uh, strong coupling scale, is not. Uh, so you might ask that, okay, we have this formula and we, we, we can compute part of it, say we can compute H, but we can't still compute F, so what good is this? Because I can't still make, uh, I can't, uh, still make any prediction for this. And the idea is that we rely on the fact that this function f that appears here is essentially a universal function. And what I mean by that is uh, the same function essentially appears in different processes, which again involves the proton. And to give you an example of that, we can look at the Drelian process. So here, once again, I'm looking at the process which involves two protons in the initial state. So I have a PP. So this is typically what I would look at at the LHC. And the process I'm looking at here is that the P and P collide to create a lepton pair, okay? So that's my final state. And uh, once again, from an effective field theory point of view, I have two scales in the problem, one of which is the invariant mass of the lepton pair M, uh, which, is my, which is the UV scale in this particular process. And the IR scale remains the same, which is lambda QCD, which characterizes the mass of the two hadrons. So again, I have a separation of scales. And so uh, I can always talk about this again in the form of an EFT. So once again, I can write down uh, essentially uh, a factorization formula. Again, separating out the physics at these two separate scales uh, in the form of a heart function. Uh, so the heart function in this case, H is, is different than the one we had for the case of DIS, but uh, because it sits at the UV scale, which is perturbative, I can compute it analytically. So that's, there's no problem with that. Uh, the other two functions are essentially the part on distribution functions. So these again appear. So these are the same functions that appear in the case of DIS. Uh, so given these two examples, we can see that no matter what the process is, as long as I'm colliding the same hadron, I keep getting back the same function uh, which describes the physics of the hadron at its uh, scale lambda QCD. So in that sense, it's a yeah. naive question. Uh, yeah. in, in the diagram, a soft gluon exchange between e, in and out state, right? That violates the uh, factorization theorem. Yes. Are you saying that its effect is lambda squared by m squared? Uh, well, for the Drelian, if it's an inclusive process, there is no soft function. This is the complete uh, factorization. No, so no, the no. only a soft yeah. gluon exchange between the two in states between the beams that you cannot write in as a soft function times a hard function times a soft. You can't write that way, right? no? 
Well, that again, that, that depends upon what you're measuring in the final state. Factorization violation does happen, but that only happens for certain specific observables. In this case, when I'm measuring just the invariant mass of the lepton pair, this mm -hmm. is the correct factorization. And there is no other soft function that I need to account for or any other radiation up to leading power in this ratio. My, you see that what my problem is. The problem is that if I have a gluon between the two incoming state, yeah. it's a separate gluon from you, right? I, I'm not sure that it depends on the FI the way you have written down in that function. Yeah, yeah, but but the point is that that's uh, for that soft gluon to have any effect on the final state measurement that you're making, right? I have to make some other measurement for it to be sensitive to that soft radiation. Does that make it, sense? It's not a radiation. It's a diagram with a gluon exchange, you know, between the two. Sure. It's two incoming so, beams, and there yes. is a soft gluon between the two incoming beams. No, that I sure. do not think it factorizes that diagram. Uh, again, I, I, I can tell you precisely where. So I can tell you that those type of diagrams that you're talking about only yes. lead to factorization violation in very specific cases of measurements. For example, if I was doing PP to HH, then in that case, yes, I would have a problem with factorization and I would not be able to write such a factorization formula. No, but but, but that, what you are talking about, I, I think is a gluon exchange between in-state and out-state. I'm talking about just a between the two in-states. So when right. you are talking about DIAs, right? Even in DIAs, the photon exchange would lead to something like that, but that we can leave, leave out because we are mostly interested in the um, in the you know the QCD corrections to it, right? From right. the from the next order. Limit. But right. here you would have, on principle, you could have a you know gluon exchange between the two in-state. You have a gluon exchange between the in-state and the out-state, you know, and that leads to the violation of the uh, yeah. So thing. so. So I can tell you that the, the gluon that you are talking about, the one which is exchange between these two, right? Essentially. Can you see my cursor? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, between these two, right? So I can tell you that that is automatically accounted for by, uh, by a Wilson line, which is there inside the definition of the part on distribution function. So it, there, is, there is no factorization violation in this process. So I, I can show you one paper, uh, maybe you have seen that one in which they prove that there is no factorization violation for this inclusive process. Whenever uh, there is a soft gluon exchange like that. So this is sort of what is called as an active active exchange because those two quarks are um, actively interacting in the heart process. And yeah, yeah. whenever something occurs- but it's not just X, no, you, you also have these two other lines that are uh, sticking out of the in-state and out-state. Yes, no? so even that, so those are the spectators. So even yes. the exchange between the spectator and the active is accounted for inside the, uh, is accounted for inside the Fs or the Wilson lines that appear inside the part on distribution functions. So there are only very specific observables where this does not happen, but DIS uh, or DIS and Relan are not one of those. So I can exactly show you where that proof is uh, and I can send you the paper. Exactly okay, where that, that, that would be nice. Thank you. I mean, yeah. it's okay. hard to believe, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, actually, I, I will refer to that paper in this talk as well. And uh, uh, you can see that for active, active and active spectator exchanges for this particular process, uh, it actually holds. Anyway, okay, thanks for the question. Uh, so, uh, so in this case, as I said, uh, you have the PDF, uh, in this case, two copies of the PDF, uh, which is again, the same function that appears for the case of DIS, and you have this function, which is perturbatively calculable. And the idea is that this PDF isolates the, uni and which is the reason why I'm saying that it's universal is because the same function appears in both of these functions. And in some sense, you have gained back your predictive power, even if you can't calculate these PDFs, because you can extract the PDF from one of these experiments and then make a prediction for the other, uh, which was typically the case before you actually couldn't compute any of these functions. Anyway, so, so why should we care about factorization is apart from this nice universality, we also get a precise operator gauge invariant operator definition for this universal non perturbative physics. So namely that for the PDF, for example, we can write the result as a trace over uh, a gauge invariant operator. So these are just quark fields, which are connected by a collinear Wilson line. And this is computed in the background of the density matrix of the hadron. So what good is this is that, um, 
if you actually wanted to make a precise prediction of this for this process numerically, uh, using factorization, now you have reduced the problem to just computing the PDF instead of simulating the whole process, right? So instead of doing the whole thing on the lattice, uh, taking two hadrons and doing the computation in real time or simulation real time, which you can't even do on the lattice, perhaps you might be able to do it one day on a quantum computer. But even then, that is horrendously more expensive than just computing one function, right? So that's the first advantage of having factorization. The second is that because you have a precise operator definition, the renormalization of the operator or basically the radiative corrections that appear for, for this function can be done only once, uh, independent of any experiment, any specific experiment, for example, in the case, either it's DIS or, uh, or a Dalian, and independent of any specific hadron, mostly because uh, all the radiative corrections and the running just depends upon the definition of the operator and not of the state of the particular hadron. So for example, for the PDF at leading order, we just have a D, D lab evolution equation, which uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Uh, the third thing we can do is because uh, we have this uh, radiative corrections to be done only once in your whole lifetime, um, the entire, the, all the numerical predictions can be improved by resumming large logarithms in the ratio of the two separated scales. So in this case, what we mean by that is we can resum a whole tower of these logarithms which appear in the cross section. Uh, and these are all large logarithms, which means that they contribute significantly to the cross section. And lastly, but not the least, this type of factorization is usually systematically improvable, which is to say that, um, each of these functions in this, in this factorized formula can be computed to any order in perturbation theory, first of all, going to higher and higher order. Uh, at the same time, if you want to be even more precise, which we can go to higher powers in my expansion parameter. So, uh, so in that sense, this is a systematically improvable process or calculation. Okay, so since we will be ultimately be interested in, um, in the physics of jets, uh, we want to now look at uh, a process which is slightly more complicated than the one for um, uh, DIS or Dalian. So here we want to consider the case when I have two jets, uh, I have two uh, protons again colliding and creating a high energy jet. So what I'm measuring at the, end of, at the end of the day is I'm isolating a jet with a certain radius and transverse momentum PT uh, along with anything else which I don't care about. So this is basically known as semi-inclusive jet production. And in this case, uh, if I look at the scales in the problem, I essentially have three scales. One is the jet PT, which is the ultraviolet scale of the problem. Then I have an intermediate scale, which you can think of the virtuality of the jet, which is PT times R. And finally, so, uh, and finally you, uh, you still have the hadron mass scale lambda QCD, which is the infrared scale in the problem. So again, for this kind of process, which is slightly more complicated because you have now three scales and a hierarchy between them, uh, we can actually again write down a, a factorization formula. Uh, once again, uh, I have the two copies of the PDFs which appear in this cross section, which are the same as for the Drellian and DIS. And then for describing the production of the jet and uh, how it evolves, you have a heart function, which basically describes all the physics at the scale PT which is our UV scale and a jet function, which sits at the scale PTR. And uh, essentially that describes the evolution of the jet or the shower itself, okay? So once again, you have this nice separation of physics between uh, at different scales and each of the functions describes the physics at one particular scale. And again, this is correct to leading order in this case of two expansion parameters, because I have three scales here. Uh, one of them is R, which is the radius of the jet. So we are going to assume that R is small. And the other is the ratio of my IR to the UV scale. Uh, okay, so in this case, as, as before, FA and FB are not calculable analytically, but the jet function is actually is portably calculable because it sits at a scale higher than lambda QCD. Uh, and so is the hard function. So everything except the PDFs, again, uh, is... Uh, is just analytically calculable in this case as well. So that's very nice for us. And that again, allows us to make predictions for this kind of a process. Okay, so 
my reason for going through all of these examples was just to give you an idea that it is in fact possible to make predictions for um, for uh, uh, even when you have strongly coupled media involved uh, for various kinds of uh, processes, including those involving jets. So we can now turn our attention to actually the problem that we're interested in, which is the factorization for heavy ion jet physics. So I can pause here and maybe if people have any questions, uh, they can go ahead and ask me. Uh, otherwise, I can uh, continue ahead. Okay. All right. So, so the process that we want to consider, at least the simplest one that we want to consider is this. So we have again two nucleons. So imagine that we are doing a heavy ion collision now. So a couple of the nucleons, one from one of the ions and the other from the other ion, um, undergoes a hot scattering, which creates a jet. Now in the background of the jet, the rest of the rest of the nucleons are basically creating your QGP medium. And so the jet that's created in this, in this hard process is now going to travel through that QGP. And essentially we want to describe this process. So the cross section is again going to be E plus E, uh, sorry, uh, is going to be just jet plus X. So we want to isolate a jet with a certain radius R and transverse moment of PT. Uh, so in this case, for the evolution of the jet in the QGP, the IR scale for the problem becomes the temperature of the QGP or MD, which is the Debye screening mass. Uh, for my case, where it's a strongly coupled fluid, and so the coupling G is of the order one, these two scales are of the same order. And so that forms the IR scale for my process. Uh, so what I want to do now is draw an analogy with deep analytics to scattering and try to convince you that this process in which the jet actually probes the QGP medium is exactly the same problem as uh, the virtual photon probing uh, a hadron or a nucleus in a DIS experiment. So the first thing I can do is basically compare uh, the scales in the two problems. Uh, so I, I can basically say that the, the, the photon energy essentially uh, in the case of DIS plays the same role as the jet PT for the case of the jet probe in the QGP. The photon virtuality Q is the corresponding scale to the virtuality of the jet, which is PTR. And the scale lambda QCD, which is the IR scale in this process is essentially equivalent to the IR scale, uh, which is the temperature in case of the QGP. So in both, both cases, we are probing some strongly coupled fluid with some external hard probe. Uh, and so the conclusion we want to draw from here is that a jet probing the QGP is essentially the same problem as the electron probing the nucleus even though one of the probes is space-like, in this case, the electron, uh, the photon, whereas this one is time-like. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but otherwise, there is a one-to-one -one correspondent, correspondence in the scales between the two problems. So that allows me sort of to define a Bjorken X for the case of the QGP in the same way as we define for the case of uh, the DIS experiment. So in particular, uh, just by the same definition that I use for defining my X, Bjorken X for the hadron, I can also define Bjorken X for uh, the QGP and it's defined in terms of these scales here. And we can verify that this essentially is the same definition for uh, the case of DIS. So, uh, so as we know, the for the case of um, DIS, we already have a nice factorization theorem, at least for uh, the large X limit, which is the one I showed you earlier in the first slide. And so one can hope that with this analogy, we can actually do the same kind of factorization for the case of uh, the jet probing the medium uh, with this modified definition of X, that's all. So that would be the regime of X going to one, and we can hope that Therefore, we can factorize this cross section in terms of a hard jet function that sits at the scale PTR or Q and a medium PDF, which is in this case would be the PDF of the quark gluon plasma that would sit at the scale T. So this is something that I'm working on right now. Um, so the other regime in this case is where X is much smaller than one. So this factorization essentially works for X out of order one, but the other regime, which is of great interest. I, I, is Varun, I can I ask a very naive question? So yeah, the, um, when I think of like uh, 
you know, uh, like, you know, a nucleon, like a proton or a neutron and, a, you know, photon coming in. Uh, yeah. in, in effective field theory, I, I could start, you know, still try to think of it like this has a, you know, large number of moment operators, high dimensional operators, and each of them are proving the structure of that uh, particular, um, you know, composite state, right? This, at least in my mind, that's, that's how I, I think when about deep inelastic scattering. Now, when I, when you give here, you're, you're trying to draw a comparison between now, uh, uh, how QGP interacts with the jet. Yeah. Right. So, do you have some sort of uh, similar description of, uh, uh, you know, some effective description of uh, a jet being and, you know, and an object and uh, like QGP being a second object and, and, uh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. At yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so what I will do is, uh, so what I was going to say right now is that, the EFT that I had developed so far is for the X much, much, one, much, much less than one regime. And that is the one I'm going to talk about in detail for the next. So there I will talk about precisely what the effective action is. What do I mean by the jet exactly? What do I mean by the QGP? What are the functions and everything like that? Uh, Sorry, could you once again explain why this particular combination for X? Oh, so this, this is, this basically follows from the same definition that comes from DIS. So for DIS, it's defined as Q square over uh, uh, the mass of the hadron times the energy of the of the photon, basically. So in the same way here, uh, the corresponding scales for the for uh, QGP is just PTR square. So that's Q square for uh, for if I follow the analogy of the scales. And this is T is basically the mass of the hadron for me, and PT is the energy of the probe, which in this case is the jet. So in that sense, there is a it's the same same equation. Just I change the scales from Q to PTR from lambda QCD to T. That's all. Sorry, I'm I'm being dumbheaded probably here. I mean, I I can see the parallelism in terms of multi-scale problem in these two different problems, yeah. but I I do not see the physical analogy that you're trying to. Yeah, 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 yeah. So let me go ahead a couple of slides and I will explain to you what exactly is is in detail the analogy between these two. Does that make sense? Uh, maybe that will that will be okay. Yeah. But this is just a qualitative picture right now. I'm just drawing an analogy between scales. I haven't given you anything and any more details right now. Okay. So uh, uh, yeah. Hey, yeah. Can I ask a few, uh, just one yeah, clarification? Yeah. T is not temperature here. Uh, or T, T is, is the temperature, temperature and MD. Yeah, MD is the other scale, which is. Why X should care about medium temperature at all? Is there any, uh, like any, uh, how should I uh, understand it? So, so the... yeah, so so just to clarify, this X is not the X of the proton. Uh, this mm -hmm. is just an abstract uh, expansion parameter that I can derive based on the analogy that I take with. Uh, oh, okay, AI. it's it's not right. energy fraction. I thought it is energy fraction of the. In the some sense, it is. Um, in some sense, it is the energy fraction of the partons in the QGP, which will be interacting with the jet. So you can think of it that way. Yeah. But, okay. the, but the target in this case is the QGP. So that's the object that we are probing, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so as I was saying, so once I define this X, I can have two regimes, one in which X is of the order one. And the factorization for this is something that I'm working on. I'm not going to talk about in this in this in this talk. The other regime, which is where x is much smaller than one, is the one for which I have developed the EFT already, and that's the one I will talk about in detail for the rest of this lecture. And um, basically, try and explain to you why this analogy holds between the two and how exactly it holds. Okay, so that's the plan. So so here's the here's the uh, case for that. So even then, this is the more interesting case uh, compared to the case for large X, at least for uh, heavy ion collisions. Okay. So apart from these three scales that I have already mentioned, when X is much smaller than one, uh, or when it is small X physics, uh, the probe, either the jet interacting with the QGP, or um, uh, in the case of uh, DIS, it's the photon which. Um, basically fluctuates into QQ bar dipole, which then interacts with the hydronal nucleus. So that's the probe for the case of uh, DIS. Uh, 
Um, in both cases, our probe is going to interact multiple times with the medium in the small X regime. So that's the physical regime that we are in. And because of the fact that the probe interacts multiple times with the medium, uh, there are certain other scales which become important in this process. We'll describe this process. So one of them is just the medium size or the length of the medium or its temporal size in the case of QGP. The other is the coherence time of the probe, which is essentially the time scale over which the probe maintains its quantum coherence or the time scale over which it goes on shell. Uh, and that's given as its energy over QT square. And the third scale is basically the mean free path of the probe in the medium. Now we don't really care about these scales when I'm doing large X, because in that case, the probe interacts just once with the medium and these quantities usually are not useful or meaningful in that context. But for the small x case, uh, they are extremely important and I will show you how they, what role do they play in my effective field theory. Okay, so I understand there are a lot of scales in this problem, but for now we are going to focus mainly on these three ones again and try to see what the EFD looks like for this case. Okay, so from so, here on- So, so yeah. in lambda, a lambda image is essentially separate hard scatterings of the probe itself or the lambda mft yeah i i i will i i'll define that uh, so it's an emergent scale so i will i precisely define that quantity uh, quantitatively but roughly speaking uh, yes you're right it's basically the average distance between uh, uh, the interaction of the probe with the medium essentially right okay. So what's the average length between the interactions? That, that's roughly the idea of what the mean free path is. Okay. okay. So, so now I'm going to talk about basically an effective field theory for small x physics. So the EFT that I'm going to talk about will work equally well for the case of the jet probing uh, the quark gluon plasma or uh, the dipole probing the heavy nucleus. Uh, so I will use those words interchangeably uh, throughout this uh, uh, throughout the discussion. So let's see how that works. So what I'm going to work is uh, work uh, work within is the soft cooling effective theory formalism, essentially, which is known as CET, which some of you might be familiar with. But I'll give you a, a brief introduction as to what what we're going to do here. So the basic philosophy of uh, SCET is that. Um, for all the radiation that's available to you uh, in the entire of phase space, uh, you carve up your phase space into certain specific regions uh, in which the momentum of the radiation scales in a very specific way, depending upon the scales in the problem. So what do I mean by that is uh, for our particular case, we have a probe, a high energy probe, and we have a medium which is sitting there. So for a high energy probe, basically you can think of it as being made up of partons which have a high energy, which are all moving in a specific direction, right? So all of the partons that I care about, which form the probe are essentially going to be isolated in a small region in the my momentum phase space, which I'm indicating here, which have some energy EJ and they have some spread around that direction, which is given by my power counting parameter. So in this case, my power counting parameter is going to be X since I'm expanding in X and I'm working the regime where X is much smaller than one. Okay, so that's going to be the effective field theory for me. And that's going to be my expansion parameter. So in that sense, once I divide up my phase space into these regions, I have essentially two um, uh, relevant degrees of freedom for my effective field theory. One of them is the energetic partons that make up my, uh, my, my probe which is either the jet or the dipole in the case of DIS. And in the other case, you have um, the medium itself, which is made up of uh, partons which have much lower energy. So we can think of them as soft partons. Uh, and we can sort of explicitly write down what the momentum of those scales, uh, of, the, of those uh, degrees of freedom scales like uh, in terms of the energy scales in the problem and our expansion parameter. So in this case, I'm every, expressing everything in light cone coordinates because uh, that's the easiest thing to do in case of uh, mostly massless partons. Uh, 
uh, which I'm going to be working with. And so these two, um, these two momenta essentially, momentum degrees of freedom are the relevant degrees of freedom for my effective field theory. Uh, I can sort of express them in a P plus P minus plane where P plus P minus are my light cone momenta. And uh, I can think of these two degrees of freedom either being soft or collinear and hence soft collinear effective theory, uh, which are separated from one another in rapidity. Okay, so they both have the same virtuality, but one of them has a much higher energy compared to the other, which is why they are separated from each other in rapidity. So that's going to be uh, my, those are going to be my degrees of freedom. So what I'm going to do is now, I'm going to write down an effective field theory, uh, which is correct to leading power in my expansion parameter, which in this case is X. Uh, and as it turns out, what I can do is I can start from the QCD Lagrangian and systematically expand it in this uh, parameter X. And what that gives me is a Lagrangian, which effectively looks like, uh, which has three pieces. One is a collinear Lagrangian, which basically tells you what about the, about all the interactions between the collinear degrees of freedom, which in this case are just the partons of the jet. Uh, then you have the soft degrees of freedom that, uh, essentially uh, uh, talk about uh, talk, uh, essentially describe the uh, the dynamics of uh, the soft degrees of freedom which in this case is is the medium and finally you have the interaction between them and in this case these interactions are mediated by what is known as the glaber mode um, some of you might be familiar with this um, so this is just an interaction term between these two degrees of freedom. So this is like a classic uh, Lagrangian. You have one degree of freedom, the other one, and an interaction term between them. And this is correct to leading power in my expansion parameter, which in this case is X, okay? So uh, as Tuhin asked me, so this is basically uh, in, this, in this paper uh, by, uh, by Ira and uh, Ian. And so this is a paper which also talks about factorization violation in detail and uh, the answer to your question about Relian basically can be found in this one um, to him um, about uh, how the active active and the active spectator uh, uh, gluon exchanges basically get absorbed in the Wilson lines uh, and hence don't affect the Relian process factorization. Um, okay, so, so that's going to be my effective action, uh, which I can derive rigorously from QCD. And these operators, LG, which mediate the interaction between my collinear, which is which I'll denote by N, and soft degrees of freedom, essentially. Um, and each of these operators in turn are gauge invariant operators made up of uh, the corresponding quark bilinears dressed with uh, Wilson lines so that they are gauge invariant, okay? So that's basically the makeup of this interaction piece. So, it, so it's a contact operator between my collinear degrees of freedom and my soft degrees of freedom. So that's the whole content of this uh, effective field theory, essentially. Okay, so now we want to use this effective action in order to see how our system evolves with time. So okay. uh, Varun, yeah. the, the soft degrees of freedom that exist in your jet itself, um, where are you putting it? I mean, you said that L soft is the, it, I, I should be thinking of it like the, like the degrees yeah, yeah. of freedom in the medium itself. And the collinear should be like degrees of freedom that are in the, uh, that are in the jet. Is it, did, did I understand correctly? I mean, that's, that's correct. But, but yeah, but you're right. There are, there are, there is soft radiation flowing, floating around as well, which connects the jet to the uh, medium. And right. all of that is also, taken into account automatically within the CFT, which is why there are Wilson lines essentially, which account for any radiative corrections that can connect the two with each other. Okay. Yeah. So again, I would uh, really refer you to this paper where it's been rigorously derived starting from QCD. Uh, so they do a rigorous matching from QCD accounting for all the radiative corrections systematically. Uh, Okay, so what we want to do is we want to use this effective theory to sort of describe our system. So what we can do is essentially what we're going to think of is that our probe, either the jet or the dipole is going to be an open quantum system. Uh, 
which is interacting with some environment around it, right? Which is clearly what the picture is in this case. Uh, so for the sake of simplicity, in this case, at least, what I'm going to do is instead of, I know that my initial state jet uh, is essentially created from a PP collision and not from an E plus E minus. Um, but uh, just for the simplicity of uh, description, I'm going to start off with an E plus E minus state, which is accurate for the case of DIS process, as you understand, because that's where I start from. For the case of the jet, in, in, in heavy ion collisions, I will start from a PP state and create the jet out of that instead of E plus E minus, which will add in uh, extra uh, baggage to my EFT essentially in the form of PDFs for that initial uh, initial nucleons as well as initial state radiation effects. So which is not, which is something I don't want to deal with right now because I want to describe the evolution of the jet after it's created uh, within the QGP medium. So for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to assume that the jet is being created by some E plus E minus heart collision, okay? Uh, so nevertheless, in each, in each case, uh, in either case, DIS or um, uh, of heavy ion, I have a QGP density matrix and I have my initial state, uh, either a PP or E plus E minus, uh, which is initially unentangled from my QGP density matrix. So that's my initial starting condition for the evolution of my density matrix. So that's my initial state density matrix, so to speak. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to evolve this density matrix with a hard operator. So a gauge invariant operator, which will create uh, the probe which is either uh, the jet or the dipole, and then evolve that probe with my effective uh, Lagrangian, which, which in this case is the effective Hamiltonian, which is the sket plus the Glauber piece, okay? So this is going to be the evolution of my density matrix with time. So just to give you an idea what the hard operator looks like is for the case of QGP, for example, it's essentially a core bilinear again, dressed with Wilson lines, which has both collinear, which has both collinear and soft Wilson lines, and what this operator is going to do, it's it's going to create my um, essentially my initial hard part on and the jet, starting from either the PP or the E plus E minus state. Okay, so that's my hard operator. So up to this point, I start with row of zero, I create my jet, and then I evolve it subsequently with my effective uh, action. Okay, and this action is going to operate for essentially for a finite period of time because of the fact that the medium that I'm probing has a finite extent either temporally or spatially, uh, which is basically indicated by the theta term here. Okay. All right, so ultimately what we want to do is we want to evolve this density matrix in time. And at the end of the day, we want to impose some measurements on it. So for the case of the heavy ion collision, we want to isolate a jet with a specific value of PT and R. So that's going to be the measurement with some uh, jet algorithm. So that will be in my M and take a trace over the density matrix as T tends to infinity, which is uh, where I'll end up at my detector. Okay, so that's the final thing that we want to compute. So uh, if I look at my action, let me go back one slide. Uh, in which I have my collinear soft degrees of freedom, basically they interact with each other via the Glauber. So at the level of the Lagrangian, you can see that they are not decoupled in the sense there is an interaction term between them. And so it's, it's not uh, so that you can see from the Lagrangian itself that they are not factorized at the level of the Lagrangian, right? Because there is an interaction term between them. So in order to prove factorization, what I have to do actually is I have to expand this this uh, row of T or the trace of row of T order by order in my interaction term. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to first expand this sigma of T order by order in my Glauber Hamiltonian. And then I'm going to prove factorization at each order. And then I'm going to sum up the whole series again at the end of the day. So that's going to be the process that I'm going to follow. Okay. And that is necessitated by the fact that this Glauber is is, uh, is uh, coupling my soft and collinear degrees of freedom. All right. Yeah, hi, can I ask a few questions? So the <clears throat> form of density matrix assumes that the jet and medium interaction is weakly coupled, right? Because there is clear factorization between these two. No, that, that there is no such, uh, I have not assumed anything like that yet. 
Oh, oh, okay. So the time evolution of uh, density matrix is in both system and environment density matrix, not just in the system density matrix. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the environment density matrix, uh, I'm assuming that it evolves on a time scale, which is much smaller than the case of the jet itself, but you can incorporate them in, incorporate any evolution in the medium via any, um, so there is a way to incorporate the evolution of the medium also. Uh, in this formalism, and I will talk briefly about that. But for simplicity, the most cartoonish picture that you can have is that you just have a QGP which is sitting there for a few minutes or for a few femtoseconds, and I have a jet flowing through it, right? And uh, uh, and suppose the medium is not evolving for now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but even if it does evolve, we can incorporate that in the media, in, in this formalism, and I will talk about that briefly later as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks. But the interaction term is this global term, right? Yes. So when yes. you are expanding in that, aren't you assuming that it's weak? No, but I'm going to resum everything back again. I, I'm, I'm all order. Okay. So this is just yeah. for technical reasons that you're doing this. this. Is for technical reasons, for okay. proving the factorization, I need to do this because of the fact that they, they couple the software and collinear degrees of freedom. Okay. That's why. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll talk about different scenarios where different approximations apply and uh, where the, we can or cannot truncate the series. Yeah. Uh, all right. So now I want to look at uh, a specific term at, uh, so I have infinite number of terms here and I want to look at a generic term in this series, uh, say the order n term. Uh, so that's what to go to, I'm going to, look, uh, going to look at and show you what the factorization looks like for that specific term. So this is the order to n term in that series, okay? So this one has, this, this one I factorize in terms of uh, three objects again. One is a heart function which again sits at my scale PT, which is the UV scale of my problem. Uh, then I have N copies of my, uh, what I will call as the medium structure function, all right? So essentially this is uh, sort of like the PDF, but not quite the PDF yet, but because it depends upon transverse momentum. So you can think of this as a T, kind of a TMD PDF for the medium in some sense. Uh, but the important thing is that this, this, there are n copies of this at an order n in this series, uh, or rather at order 2n. And this object is in the same way as the PDF is universal. This object is also universal in the sense that it does not depend upon any of the properties of the jet uh, that's probing it. Okay. So that's one thing. And the second object that appears in this factorization is the object that describes the evolution of the jet itself. Uh, or the probe itself, which is either the jet or the dipole function. Okay. Uh, and if I look at this uh, medium structure function by itself, as I said, it's, it's basically the object which is capturing the universal process independent physics of the medium. And, uh, but the renormalization group for this is slightly more complicated than the one that we see in the case of the PDF. So in the PDS, we just had a, a renormalization in the usual dimensional regularization scale mu, which gave us the DGLAP e equation in the running of the, uh, of the function. Uh, but in this case, uh, we have actually two renormalization scales. So I'll try to try and explain that. So if I look at this picture and look at the various degrees of freedom in my EFT, I have the heart function, which sits at uh, a virtuality of PT, okay? The, the other two functions in my EFT, which are the soft function um, or the dipole function and the collinear function are essentially at the, same uh, at the same virtuality in the sense that they sit in the same hyperbola on this P plus P minus plane, uh, but, and they are separated from the hard function. So the separation between the hard and the soft and the collinear functions is in, is in the usual uh, virtuality. And so, I have a usual running between these two functions and the heart function via the renormalization scale mu. So that's, that's indicated in this figure. So that's one thing. But the soft and the collinear functions themselves are separated from each other in rapidity. And so I have another renormalization scale which accounts for this separation between the two functions. And so each of these functions obeys two renormalization group equations, one which corresponds to evolution in virtuality and one which corresponds to evolution in rapidity. Uh, and as it turns out, for the evolution in rapidity, the equation is what is known as the BFKL equation, uh, 
So for those who are not familiar with it, this is sort of a famous equation which appears in small x physics. Um, and which was somewhat something expected because we are doing small x physics after all. And so this equation has to appear uh, in the description of this process. So in our EFT, it appears via this renormalization group equation of these two functions essentially, okay? Um, and so in the usual way, we can sort of do an RG running between these two functions uh, as well as between the hard function. And that will resum for us all the large logarithms in the ratio of the various scales. And in particular, solving the BFKL equation, which will basically resum for us all the logarithms in X, which is the expansion parameter for EFT, okay? Uh, both in the case of heavy ions as well as in the case of small X. So that's what the factorization theorem looks like at uh, order N. Uh, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of do this resummation uh, by doing the RG evolution. So again, this function is perturbatively calculable, the jet function, but the uh, medium structure function has both perturbative and non-perturbative physics. So that is not entirely calculable, obviously, like the PDF. But even then, we can do the running between the two by solving my RG equation. So that is something we can do, uh, even though we don't know what the boundary condition is exactly, which is the non-perturbative piece here. Okay, so after I do that, what I can do is I can sum the whole series as I promised. I want to look at the series to all orders and I want to sum the entire series. And if I do that, that's what the series looks like essentially. So uh, I have two pieces again. I have a piece which describes the uh, vacuum evolution of the probe, which is to say the evolution of the probe uh, in the absence of the medium. If the medium were not there, then this would be the evolution of the probe. And then the rest of the interaction with the medium is actually very neatly expressed in terms of a path ordered exponent um, in which I can write the whole series as a path ordered exponent in terms of a single scale, which I will call as the mean free path. And I will shortly define what this object is. But essentially the idea is that if I sum that entire series, then this is what I will, I'm going to get at the end of the day after doing that summation. Okay. And to define my lambda mean free path, the inverse of the lambda mean free path is essentially defined in terms of the three functions that I just defined. Uh, the heart function, a uh, medium function, which is the, as I said, is the observable independent structure function and my jet function or the dipole function. Um, so this, if you check the dimensions of this object, it naturally turns out that this entire object together has the dimensions of an inverse length scale. And the way it appears in my expression strongly suggests it to be a mean free path because it's integrated over the extent of the medium. So to give you a physical picture of what this looks like, say I have this as my medium, it consists of several uh, partons or nucleons in the case of my, uh, in the case of a large nucleus. And I have this probe, a high energy probe, which is traversing this medium. And what this lambda mean free path is essentially is this scale, which tells you what is the essentially the average distance uh, along the direction of the propagation of the probe uh, between two interactions with the medium. So in that sense, that's why I can give it an interpretation of a mean free path. Uh, and this sort of pops out automatically out of this formalism that this object together, which appears in the exponent has the dimensions of length, okay? So uh, Barun, yeah. just to make sure yeah. I understood, uh, from your last transparency, which you did for a specific expansion term, uh, yeah. when you sum over all order in N, the, the last yeah. transparency is the final sum, right? In which the... That's right. So this is the this is the total sum. So it's an exponent of, of this. And this particular term, the exponent is this one. So if I expand this order by order, then I will have all of those infinite terms that I showed you in the last slide. Okay, very cool, yeah. Uh, Varun, a naive question, because I'm mean, not very conversant with this formalism. But, so no. uh, I thought in, in, in medium jet physics, uh, one very important quantity that comes in the naive perturbative language is uh, the, the emitted gluons and their coherent uh, interaction with the thermal uh, 
particles right right so that is all yeah. included in this lambda oh. mfp yeah, yeah. I, i'll talk about exactly what the cft is for and and so there are certain assumptions in this as you said that um uh this particular form for the eft uh, assumes that uh, essentially the successive interactions of the uh, of the probe with the medium are actually incoherent and i'll talk about when it becomes coherent what can we do about it okay thanks so this is you can think of it as the markovian approximation for the interaction of the probe with the medium that's why it's in a nice exponent right So, so in your in your formulation, where did you exactly assume it in the last slide? Yeah. yeah so the one place where I, so there are two assumptions that went into this. First of all, that um, uh, so the one assumption that I did not talk about was the one in which I said that the successive interactions of the of the probe with the medium actually happen with uncorrelated partons in the medium itself. So that's one thing. Okay. uh so which is why i have n copies of this medium structure function and not uh, just one giant function for the entire medium at each order hey, so sorry can can you go back your last slide uh, the slide before uh this one yeah sure so if, um so here still you are not doing any assumption right as far yeah, as still, yeah here i am still not doing any 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 uh, assumptions about uh, okay i see and, uh, and now can, sorry i'm being slow a bit and uh, now can you uh, go back uh, then at what step uh, this coming in like when you are doing in hg square term uh, yeah so this is the place where you are you saying it's the product of the of that's right yeah okay so that's where i'm saying that the suppose i expand this to order 4 uh, for example suppose i have hg square here and hg square here then i'm assuming that those two are separate interactions with the medium and not interfering with each other yeah understood yeah but i i will also talk yeah, about I, that yeah yeah uh, i have uh, a nice question so how do you define your system time and uh, in system intrinsic time and system relaxation time here uh Because yeah i'm not take... yeah yeah so uh so this basically is an is an assumption that um the um the mean free time mean free path of the so ultimately the assumption that is being made here is that the mean free path of the of the probe is is much larger than the coherence time of the of the of the probe which is why the probe is losing coherence between successive interactions with the medium right mm -hmm. does that make okay. sense and which is why i can do a markovian approximation in that case so basically once uh, once the probe interacts with the medium once uh before it interacts again all of the partons that are th there go on shell so they don't have quantum coherence anymore which is why the successive interactions are uh, incoherent so that's a, a, that's a, something built into this uh okay okay so the formation time is like the relaxation time uh, and the way we define in open curve okay thanks uh i'll talk about all the possible cases but this is sort of the simplest case uh, for uh, for the cft uh anyway all right so so what this so let's come back to this expression again and i want to define certain uh quantities here before i move on so first of all this quantity that appears in the exponent here is is you can think of it as an emergent expansion parameter so lambda mean free path is something which we did not have access to when we started the calculation right it is something which is emerging out of the calculation itself and so in that sense this expansion parameter which is basically the size of the medium if i do this integral it will roughly be something like the size of the medium over the lambda mean free path so that's basically the ratio that's coming over here and you can think of that as an uh, emergent expansion parameter of this formalism and then whenever this becomes one naturally when the size of the medium becomes of the order of lambda mean free path uh i need to keep this entire expression in the sense that i have to keep all the terms in my exponent right which is what i have done here 
and that sort of gives us a condition for uh, when this uh, sort of expansion breaks down. So in the case of heavy ion physics, if I do this term by term, then that's basically known as an opacity expansion, if you have heard that term before. And whenever this condition is satisfied or whenever this ratio becomes of the order of one or larger, then that's essentially the breakdown of my opposite expansion. I need to keep all the terms in my series, okay? On the other hand, for small x dis, what this defines, this condition defines is essentially the saturation scale. So uh, I can solve for what value of, at what value of Q, this ratio becomes one or this expansion parameter becomes one. And for the case of small x physics, that essentially defines the saturation scale. So as you can see, there is a nice correlation between uh, the physics in the two systems uh, based on this single equation. All right, so- uh, can, I, uh, can I ask a question? So uh, leading order in opacity works in this framework if lambda one is uh, smaller than one, right? Yeah, much smaller than one, yeah. Yeah, thanks. All right, so for those who, of you who actually work in heavy ion physics, you might be familiar with uh, the, uh, the, the, the parameter that's actually used in literature quite a lot, which is known as the jet transport parameter. And I want to show you how it relates to the uh, EFT that I have just derived. So I can actually write down the jet transport parameter, which is usually denoted as Q hat. Again, in terms of the three functions that I have, except that, I have this extra factor of k pop square, which appears in under the integral uh, in KT. And that's basically the difference between what my Q hat is and what my uh, lambda mean free path is. So, so once again, as you can see, the what I want to point out here is the, the, the jet transport parameter, which is usually used in, I think, almost all the other formalisms uh, that deal with jets in heavy ion physics. Um, as you can see from this equation, it depends both on the properties of the jet of the probe, right, via this function, and the properties of the medium via this function. And so what I want to put forward, uh, this uh, the idea is that Q hat essentially is not really a direct observable independent probe of the medium properties. So in fact, you can factorize Q hat in terms of something which is uh, actually independent of the medium properties, which uh, which we, I have which I have defined as the uh, S medium. Sorry, Barun, I am not familiar with uh, heavy ion physics. Can you define the jet transport yeah. parameter? So yeah, this is usually defined as the average uh, KT that the parton acquires or the or the probe acquires as it moves to the medium. So that's usually how it's defined. No, no, from uh, experimentally, like say, if I observe yeah. from the observation side, how do I uh, how do I define it? Uh, so, yeah, so it's defined in terms of, uh, uh, so the, so the typical experiment that you would do, for example, is, uh, I would look at the broadening of a jet. So if a jet had some, uh, PT without the medium, uh, if I make it go to the medium, then it will broaden because of the partons will acquire some transverse momentum because of its interactions with the medium. Right. Mm -hmm. And then for that cross section, you can define this Q hat. You can extract the Q hat from that cross section and sort of define an object which is the average KT that a parton acquires as it moves to the medium from that experiment. Does but, that make sense? But I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm not observing any parton. No, I mean, I mean, I'm observing the final state things in my detector. Yeah, it's yeah. So in my the, detector, like, I mean, I, I can define a jet by a clustering algorithm, but then how do okay. I get hold of this? So, yeah, so this will be, uh, so it, it, just like when you do, uh, uh, a DIS experiment, after all, you're observing hydrons, right? But the, the, the thing you're extracting is the PDF and the PDF works at the partonic level, essentially, right? So you yes. have a factorization again, in which you have a something which uh, tells you about the partonic physics and then something which tells you about the hydronic physics, which includes hydronization on top of it. So something similar here in which this Q hat essentially is... Uh, Convolved with something else, which gives you the total cross section. But this is the one that works at the partonic level, essentially. Okay, so it's it's not something like a direct observed functions like. Uh, yeah, it's not a direct observed function. It's like that. Yeah, yeah, it's fitted basically to experiment. Okay. Uh, yeah, via different kinds of measurements for 
so the the mostly the experiment that's that's done is jet quenching where you observe either the energy loss of the jet or the pt broadening of the jet so those are the experiments that you would do um but I, what I wanted to say for those who are, those who know about this and uh, those who work with this, uh, even this object I wanted to point out is not really something which is universal, but actually needs to be factorized further into uh, a piece which is actually observable independent and something which depends on the properties of the jet. Okay, so let's take stock of the situation. So, for, so far, what we have done is um, we have written down in EFT. Uh, which separates out the physics of my hard scale, which is PT, from my uh, sort of intermediate scale PTR or Q. So the EFT I have done so far is actually the EFT that is defined at this scale PTR in terms of my medium function and my jet function. But that's not the end of the story because I have another scale, which is the temperature or the Debye mass, which is, in, uh, which is uh, the lowest scale in my EFT. And so to complete this calculation, actually, we have to do one more step, which is to match the EFT at the scale, which is, which is currently at, which is PTR, down to the scale MD. Um, and this is something also which, is, which people are working on, including myself. Uh, and to truly separate out all the non-perturbative physics from the perturbative one, we have to do this extra step of matching. Um, to separate out the physics at from this of the scale PTR from the scale P, uh, MD, which is truly the non perturbative scale. So that's something I'm working on right now, and I think the paper should be out shortly on that. Um, uh, but this is an important step, I think, which uh, I don't nobody uh, nobody else ever talks about. This is heavy on community, which I always found interesting. But anyway, um, so. Now, what I want to talk about is, as we said, we have uh, certain issues about, uh, as, as um, people pointed out to me, that uh, the EFT that I have written down so far maybe is not the correct EFT for all the scenarios in the sense that um, what about uh, uh, interference or, uh, or what is known as the LPM effect, which is basically quantum interference between successive interactions and so on and so forth. So how do we deal with that? So let me just address that. Uh, I don't know, what's the time by the way? So we are way past the time. So is that okay for you guys or? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, how, how, how much longer do you have? Uh, yeah. I have uh, two or three slides, I think. That yeah, I, can I think that should be fine, yeah. All right. okay. I mean, anyway, we asked lots of questions, so that slowed you down. I think don't, don't, don't worry about time. People who get busy, they can leave. Uh, you just go on at your own pace. All right. All right. That's fine. Um, okay. So, so as I said, we, we have talked about these three scales, which were the primary scales that I started off with. But as I said, there are also, when, whenever the medium is interacting uh, with the probe and the probe uh, is, is scattering off of the medium multiple times, there are other scales which also become really important. Uh, which I said were the emergent scales, so to speak. Uh, one of them was the medium size. The other was the formation time of the jet or the probe. And the third was the mean free path. So we have defined the mean free path already via our EFT. And now we want to see whether our EFT is actually consistent, right? So for that case, for, 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 for to understand that, we want to define three quantities which define the medium. So first of all, the density of the medium. And we will say that the density is basically decided by the fact, uh, by the hierarchy between the size of the medium L and the lambda mean free path. So essentially if the man, lambda mean free path is too large compared to L, we can say it's a dilute medium. And in the reverse scenario, we can say it's a, it's a dense medium. Okay, so that's one hierarchy. The second is the length or the longevity of the medium is decided by the hierarchy between L, which is again the size of the medium and the formation time of the jet. So this basically decides whether or not your probe is going to maintain quantum coherence over the entire length of its interaction with the medium or not. Okay, so that's the hierarchy which is decided by, by these two scales. And finally, uh, the hierarchy between lambda mean free path and the formation time essentially is going to define, decide whether or not there is, quantum inf uh, there is quantum interference between the successive interactions of the probe with the medium, right? Which is something that you guys asked me about as well. So 
given these hierarchies, you can now see there are so many possibilities depending upon how these scales um, uh, uh, lie with respect to each other in terms of that value, right? Um, especially since this is an emergent scale, which we can only talk about after doing the calculation. So in that sense, we can basically give a classification of the effective field theories based upon uh, the hierarchy between these emergent scales. Uh, so the simplest one is the one where the lambda mean free path is much greater than L, which is to say it's a dilute medium. Uh, and uh, when, um, as I said, L is much, much greater than TC, then it's also a long lived medium. Likewise, so this is the case where the opacity expansion is essentially valid, where you say that there is only a single interaction of the jet with the medium because it's dilute, um, which is why I can keep just the first term in my uh, expansion in Glauber, and basically that's the opacity expansion. So the second case is where the medium is dense in the sense that uh, the length of the medium is of the order of the mean free path, uh, so, that the, the, so that the jet or the probe can have successive interactions with the medium. Uh, but it is still long lived because its, it's uh, length is much greater than the formation time of the jet. And so the interactions are still incoherent because of this hierarchy. And so in this scenario, there are multiple interactions of the medium with the jet, of, of, the, of the jet with the medium. But because of, because of this hierarchy, there is no quantum interference between them. Okay, so that's also the case that we covered so far. So the, 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 the EFE that we did so far essentially covers these two scenarios. Okay. Uh, completely. Uh, the third case is where um, the medium is again dilute in the sense that the mean free path is much greater than L. So I still have a single interaction of the jet with the medium, but in this case, it is short lived in the sense that the coherence time of the, or the, the formation time of the jet is larger than the medium size so that it maintains its coherence over its, over its interaction with the medium. Okay. So in this case, what will happen is that in this case, there is going to be some quantum interference between the production of the jet itself, the process that creates the jet and its subsequent evolution in the medium. Okay. So this will typically be the case in small systems, wherever you have like oxygen, oxygen collision or something like that, where you are colliding smaller nuclei. Uh, and this is scenario was, was the one also I dealt with in one of my papers uh, a year ago. So you can have a look as to how the EFT is modified whenever the hierarchy is, is changed. So the EFT I have talked so far will now change uh, in some sense. Uh, fine, uh, and then I have two other cases, which I think are the most complicated ones. So one of them is when the medium is dense, it's long lived and it's coherent, which means that there are multiple interactions of the probe with the medium uh, and there is successive inter uh, quantum interference between successive interactions. So this is where what is known as the LPM effect comes into play. Uh, and this is what connects to what is known as the BDMPSZ formalism in heavy ion uh, jet physics for those who are familiar with this word. So that's something I'm working on as to how this EFT is modified for this case where uh, uh, you do have these kinds of quantum interference effects. Uh, and finally, you have uh, the case of a dense short-lived medium. Um, again, short-lived means that the probe maintains its coherence over its entire interaction with the, with the, with the medium. And this is basically what is known as uh, saturation physics or the one which connects to the color, gluon, uh, color glass uh, condensate, if you're familiar with that, which is uh, the formalism developed in the context of... Uh, 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 small x or saturation physics. So as you can see that this entire framework essentially divides nicely into different hierarchies and based on these different hierarchies, the EFT changes. So I was going to talk about how to get to the CGC, how to modify the EFT that I have to get to the CGC, but I think I'm over time already. So I think I will stop at this point. So that was my next couple of topics to talk about how, how to get the BK equation, which is the saturation physics equation from by modifying the CFT. But anyway, I will skip that. Um, so to summarize, the, the main, uh, the main uh, uh, takeaway message I wanted to uh, sort of put forward in this talk is that if I have a non-perturbative medium and if you have to make any kind of quantitative predictions, then factorization is absolutely essential. Um, 
And therefore, you need an EFT framework in order to do this systematically to separate out the perturbative physics from the non-perturbative one, especially to define specific structure functions for that non-perturbative medium. And as I said, there are a bunch of open questions uh, that I still have, which is to say how to do this matching to the scale lambda QCD, uh, formulate uh, the case for the EFT for the CGC, which is almost done, and the paper will be out next uh, week or next month or so. Uh, but I have yet to tackle the problem of how to do it for BD, BDMPSC. Uh, anyway, I, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry for going over. Uh, thanks a lot, Varun. Uh, so I would suggest this. I mean, I presume people may want to hear since you have a couple of slides about CGC, etc. So let us first take any other questions that people may have so that we kind of, and then if somebody is interested, they can ask about the slides that you did not cover. And so, I mean, I will probably stop the recording and then we can go ahead uh, with uh, whatever I wish. So, any other uh, questions you have? Uh, Shomanda, can I ask? <coughs> yeah, sure. yeah. uh, so, uh, very nice talk, Varun. Uh, I just want to ask you that uh, since for the ex uh, you have seen in the recent times that probably the small systems. They have behaved a little bit, uh, I mean, uh, QGP like, we, where we had issues emerging for PP and PLED. So, uh, right. how would you like to address them? Uh, because in the LHC domain, many surprising things are happening. And uh, right, right. So, so I, I would say that for me, the the framework that's here is sort of agnostic about what is the specific. Um, state of the medium that I'm talking about. So uh, in this case, for example, I talked about both the nucleus, which is which is basically a hydronic state and the, uh, and the QGP, and both can be sort of uh, written in terms of the same EFT. So the state will change, but the EFT framework itself is the same by which I mean the operators that go into those matrix elements or the structure functions will remain the same. So granted that when I, when I do small systems or when I do heavier systems, either the QGP is created or maybe it's somewhere in the intermediate state, not yet QGP. Um, so that state, state specificness essentially is not there in the EFT. That's what I want to say. Uh, whatever state it is, you are just probing that state and the framework that I have developed essentially works for any of those, if that makes sense. The one thing I would like to say for small systems is, as I said, uh, because of the fact that they are small and therefore short-lived, so it might be worth considering this scenario where I don't think anybody has considered that yet, where I actually have a quantum interference between jet production and its evolution in the medium. Um, so that would be the EFT I would suggest to apply for that scenario. That's all I can say. Uh, what exactly do you mean by this quantum interference? I mean, it is some sort of... Uh... Uh, so it basically uh, means that whether or not I can... Uh, so I can think of the medium as being made of... Suppose I think of the medium as being made of different nucleons. Suppose I take the case of DIS and I have a big nucleus. And suppose the nucleus is just a bunch of bunch of nucleons. So the probe, in this case, is going to interact with one nucleon, and then it's going to interact with the second nucleon, right? And mm -hmm. then the third one, or the fourth one, and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. depending on the mean free path. And whether or not I can treat the interaction of the first and the second independently, or whether it's one coherent process in the sense of a single Feynman diagram, is what I mean by quantum interference here. Okay. 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 So I was, I mean, I did HBT, so I was thinking something different in from quantum Bose-Einstein statistics. No, no, it's different. Okay, no, nothing like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, it's fine. I mean, because this, this uh, issues which we are facing with the data uh, is, is that how to understand these small systems or uh, small systems actually. So this is where I think your model will be very effective. Thank you. Right.